human capacity to deal with uncertainty is what we call imagination. The business organizations exist by harnessing the capacity for imagination to the business's purposes. Welcome to the License to Lead podcast. I'm Patty Fay. This podcast is for physicians or anyone who thinks healthcare needs a transformation led by physicians. License to lead means that physicians are charged with and must be in charge of guiding the vision and the culture of healthcare systems. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the License to Lead podcast. Okay, you've been on pins and needles, right? I left you with a cliffhanger in the first part of my conversation with Professor J.C. Spender. Professor Spender is an author, a former business school dean, and an expert in business strategy, history, and ethics. And I would add, he's a philosopher, a dimension that is even more obvious in this second podcast. I had just asked him if getting an MBA was a good thing. Was it a valuable degree for a healthcare manager when Dr. Spender was pulled away by a phone call? And since we were overdue to wrap up part one of our podcast, I just let that question dangle. We'll pick up the conversation as he answers that question. And we will also talk about what he calls the secret, the role of imagination in business and the lack of value creation through what he calls the language of business or the economic discourse. With his professorial and contrarian style, he aims to set me straight on any number of issues and takes us on a ride through the balanced scorecard, managerial versus financial accounting, the origin of the business school, Oliver Cromwell, the multiplicity of languages, madrasas, and more. And I'll provide a few outtakes of our conversation, which I know you'll enjoy. And there's more information and spenderisms in the License to Lead newsletter. Okay, here we go, picking up where we left off last time with the question about the MBA. If somebody wanted to very effectively manage that economic entity, would getting an MBA provide what's needed? Yes. That's a kind of modified yes and a slightly tangled yes. But I mean, the basic intuition here on the part of hospital system administrators is that MBA training provides you with some skills for understanding the economic machinery in which we are embedded. So in just the same way as some of the senior uh, people there have to understand the medical discourse, it's also increasingly important to have senior people there, some senior people who understand the economic discourse. Mm -hmm. There's money to be raised, there's taxes to be paid, there's allocations to be made, there are investments to be made, et cetera. Now, MBAs don't exactly get trained in this. It's a slight misunderstanding, to say the least. Uh, but what MBAs, the reason why the MBA is such an important degree to the person that gets it is that it enables them to speak to the economic discourse. So you don't need to understand anything about medicine to be able to say to the hospital administrator, one of the ways in which this hospital is funded is by patient bills. And I've had a look at this, and some diseases are costing much more than the fees we're collecting. We're making a loss. This is what marketing people might call product mix. Right? So you, as the skilled financial person, can say to the hospital, financially speaking, I have to tell you, this activity is a loss and it's not getting any better. And you should think about pulling it out of the product mix. Now, you as the medical person would say, but you don't seem to understand. This disease is an occupational disease, which is characteristic of this particular community, which was built on making steel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so knowing when to put aside financial principle in favor of some other reality. But the answer is we're increasingly organized socially and personally, as well as organizationally, using economic ideas. And therefore, 
every organization needs people who have some skills in, under, in talking that language and understanding that language and knowing how to read that data and so forth. So yes, and the reason for MBAs is not their skill in business, like Dick Tarling, who had no MBA, <laughs> who was a business genius, like Musk, who's a business genius. You know, there are plenty of people who, well, not plenty of people, there are occasional people who are standout business geniuses. This is an artistic medium in which some people are like Da Vinci. What MBAs get trained in is speaking the language and reading the data. They may be as dumb as a post, right. but they actually can understand what is being said. And they can help you as the hospital executive, they can help you understand the problem here is that we have a loss-making activity, and that is threatening our sense of communal strategy. You need to think about that. That's your decision as the big boss. I'm here simply to tell you what this bit of economic conversation is telling you. You need somebody to do that. Yeah. I've had the former president of the American Medical Association on my podcast a couple of times, and she started a big oncology group in New Mexico and a number of other foundations. And I asked her if she had an MBA you know, to help her understand this language. And she said, no, she took a night accounting class and it served her just fine. And in fact, I haven't had a physician leader yet on my podcast with an MBA. The way that I see it, a lot of times in healthcare systems as physicians end up in higher administrative roles, they're asked to go, you know, scamper over to the business school and get themselves an MBA. And I object to that, some of it because of the things that you and others have said about the business school, you know, doesn't create managers, but also the opportunity costs of going to learn a language which physicians can probably pick up pretty quickly you know, really the opportunity costs of spending that time when they're already being pulled every which way and needed in every room and to be in every conversation. So what do you think of that? Well, I think uh, she is not only a superb medical profession, but also a business genius. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. You probably heard of the balanced scorecard mm -hmm. put together by a chum of mine called Bob Kaplan and uh, Howard Johnson. And the balanced scorecard came into being because accounting courses in the United States neglected what is called managerial accounting in favor of what is called financial accounting. Why? Well, financial accounting is dealing with external markets, fundraising, you know, packaging bonds, et cetera, everything that gave us the 2008 crisis, whereas managerial accounting, the antithesis to managerialism maybe, <laughs> managerial accounting is actually working out how the economics of this organization function. In the UK, it used to be called estimating. Now, when you, when you put in a bid to build a bridge, you have to submit a price. This bridge has never been built before. How are you to determine what the bid should be? And the answer is you turn to a group of people called estimators in the UK, who very carefully go through all of the designs down to the last nut and bolt and washer, and create a bill of materials and tell you how much it's going to cost to build this bridge. But managerial accounting leads to people who are managerial accountants, who go to work for companies that build bridges and get paid a pittance. Whereas financial accounting leads to brash young things who go and work on Wall Street to put together bonds who earn dizzying amounts of money. So managerial accounting disappeared or as exceedingly uh, uh, threatened species. I forgot what that term. Endangered. Endangered species, right. Endangered mm -hmm. species. So a company, uh, and the story as far as I know, uh, is the company in California rang up by Bob Kaplan and, and his friend Harold Johnson and said, look, we're having a real problem because every time the board gets together, the conversation is dominated by the financial accountants. Right. But we're a company that makes stuff. And has people employed. And has people employed. Mm -hmm. And we can't get that conversation on the table. 
So Bob Kaplan and his friend went out there and they sat and they, you know, they put their thumbs in their mouths for a couple of months watching what was going on and said the problem is what we might call balance of conversation. So they created this facilitation device, which is called the balance scorecard, which said, yes, yes, the finance people, you know, have their share of the conversation. But the other three lobes in the matrix must be allowed to have their say. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not doing strategy, you're playing financial games. And this is a business that requires a strategy for dealing with the real world with a bunch of people who do stuff. So I think the big dots on the balance scorecard, some of the dots are a lot bigger than the others. And I think the ones with the dollar signs in them still dominate the conversation at most boards. Yeah, well, that's the problem. But you see, going back to the whole question of critique, Bob Kaplan and his chum Johnson are honest enough intellectuals to say, we need to find a way of critiquing the dominance of the financial conversation. Mm -hmm. And they made this little bit of, of equipment, which has been vilified by academics who have no understanding of what the hell they're doing. This is a little piece of apparatus. You know, it's exactly the same as some facilitators would use a, you know, a beanbag to toss from one person with the conversation to the other. The balance scorecard is this facilitation aid in order to balance the strategy away from being dominated by finance towards something more appropriate to the business. Now, oh, if only it worked. If, oh, if only it worked. Right. You know, and, and the thing is, JC, even the way we've been speaking, that it's critical for people to learn the language, perhaps go invest a year and a half in learning the language uh, by going to business school. Even that is tipping our hands that the financial angle is dominating, right? We have to go learn that language. We have to learn to read this spreadsheet or this financial statement. And of course we do, but there is an imbalance, I would say, in how critical it is in, in the assumptions about the financial underpinnings of a successful business, no matter how large. Will going to a business school, will that information and knowledge make me a successful manager? Right. Well, here's what I was speaking to the other day about as the secret. If you understand that the economic language is incapable of creating new economic value, mm -hmm. It's to do with the type of uncertainty and how you engage the type of uncertainty. This is a, a more complicated statement. It, it's that the conversation we were having about entropy says there has to be value being created somewhere. The secret is it is not possible to do that in the economic discourse. The only way of doing it is what everybody knows, which is by theft. You know, so Proudhon said, all wealth is theft. It's my imagination and my right. tacit knowledge that has to be stolen to create value. Monetized. 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 Mm -hmm. So the, the organization is an apparatus for monetizing the imaginations imagination activity of the people who are engaged, and their imagination is directed towards the uncertainties of the situation. So why do we have a doctor when we could have an AI diagnostic tool that 85% of the time, the patient sticks his finger in, in this apparatus and he's diagnosed? Because if the business can run with 85% correct diagnoses, then it's potentially completely automatable. And that's a strategic decision because in practice, you can't do it that way. You have to have the imagination being brought into engagement if value is to be created that more than compensates 
for the entropic losses. Really, the economic structure, the business structure is neutral. I mean, it's a uh, sterile. No, 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 on, no. On the contrary, I mean, you know, we don't need to be raving Marxists to know that it has embedded aesthetic. Why do you value money when you say economics? You're combining a, a quasi-mathematical way of analyzing the world with a predisposition to value money. So we know what's up and what's down because of our values. If we have an input-output mach machine where there's input of uh, X um, mechanical what's its and money, an output of, of X, Y mechanical outputs and money, okay? I mean, the point is that that makes no sense to us unless we value money, even though the logic of the arrangements can be perfect. So, which is one of the reasons why during the time after the Russian Revolution, people seriously believed that they could run the entire country as if it was one large bureaucratic enterprise. That's managerialism. But they, they had made a horrendous historical error in thinking that the way of talking that they had articulated was phronesis again, was adequate to the situation. And tens of millions of people had to die of starvation before the penny or the, in this case, the ruble dropped. So it's understanding that the economic language, both as we take it up and regard it as important, we give it of inherent values, but it is also limited in what it can address. So the point that I'm really trying to make is that the creation of value, which ultimately is the reason why we are interested in organizations, because they are very effective ways of harnessing people's imaginations to the creation of value. Okay? The economic discourse is not sufficient to cover the whole of what actually happens in practice. You set right. that up. The lacunae. <laughs> it's missing. The lacunae. <laughs> it is missing the, yeah, the imagination. It's missing the work, the actual product. Right. And you have to begin with the uncertainties because the human capacity to deal with uncertainty is what we call imagination. The business organizations exist by harnessing the capacity for imagination to the business's purposes. Right. This is the complicated. No, that's bit. fascinating. I think that's fascinating. Is that what one might learn in a business school? <laughs> no because they have no discussion about the nature of imagination. And they say, oh, yeah, we have entrepreneurial organizations. And it's like, no, 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 you've missed the point. You have to understand the separation between the human being and the capacity for imagination and the organization and its nature. The organization cannot imagine. And nor are the people who work for the organization ever so completely part of the organization that there is not an ethical challenge here, which is what kind of ethics are involved in the monetization of your imagination so that my shareholders don't throw me out. The fundamental business ethics problem is, on the one hand, going back to the debating society. Okay, Yes, running the debating society is a lot of hard work. And last year, you know, Fred did it, and next year, Monica's going to do it. And we understand that it's exhausting, but it's you know, part of the deal. But when we have a business, who speaks about imagination? We cloud it under, well, we want uh, organizations of trust. It's like, why should we use the notion of trust, which is deeply personal, when the whole purpose of talking about it is to monetize it in order to satisfy the shareholders' demands. We call it intellectual property. Right. Imagination wouldn't fly. You'd get booted out. Absolutely. No. You mentioned early on that, you know, what used to be, you didn't use this language, you mentioned the shop floor, but early on the business schools were trade schools. And at some point, you know, so the guy... No, no. No, you see, this is part of the mythology. The, yes, there is a tradition of, of training shop floor people, very important tradition. 
But the actual origin of business schools is something quite different. Okay, it actually goes back to Bismarck and the times when the welfare state was being created in Prussia, which was a huge invention of creating state organized healthcare as well as state organized military activity and so forth. So it was understood that one of the ways of making this work politically was to train people in what was known as Staatswissenschaft, statecraft, organizing society. And the original business schools were schools of statecraft, S-T-A-T-E, craft, like the welfare state. Okay? They were public, what we would call public sector activities. So there's, there's a wonderful history of this, which has a number of points to make. One is that the people who were engaged in this, the people who did this knew, for the most part, that it was bullshit. But it looked good. It was politically expedient to say, our senior civil servants are being trained in statecraft. And it looked good because that then reassured the electorate that the taxes were being collected in a rational manner and distributed in a rational manner. If you really understand the history, you understand that it was always a political project and that from a scientific point of view, it was bullshit. Nobody actually believed this stuff, but it was politically expedient. I, I think that's reflected in what you said earlier about eschewing criticism. You know, the, the inability to withstand criticism makes you think it's kind of a house of cards that they're defensive. There's no, there's no there there. And so to criticize is to destroy, is to reveal, you know, the emperor has no clothes. Is that a legitimate observation, do you think? Mm, absolutely. But the point is that the business schools do something that the recruiting companies value, which is they teach a cohort of people how to speak in a certain way. Okay. That's all they expect of them, that they dress talk and behave like mini managers. The idea that they are skilled managers, the recruiting companies don't ask for that and they don't get it. So we have all of these misconceptions about what business schools are trying to do. And the answer is- What are they trying to do? Yeah, what they what not only are trying to do, and unfortunately, the faculty are absolutely at the center of this set of misunderstandings. If you work for Goldman Sachs and you're hiring two people from Stanford Business School, you know these people have the capability to survive in a competitive environment, which is the way we run this business. Okay, Other people run businesses in different ways, but Goldman Sachs, you compete. Mm -hmm. And you also know how to talk and read the stuff we deal with, which is you know, financial gibberish. Mm -hmm. That's all you want, and that's what you get. Are they going to be future uh, masters of the universe? Are they going to be future people who can run Goldman Sachs? The answer is, don't worry about that. That's 20 years down the line. The cream will float to the top. And you mentioned that there was sort of a blank stare uh, from the business community when asked, what do you need? What, what can we develop in our curriculum that will serve your needs and the business community as an entity had no response to that. And that makes me wonder if the people in the business community who are successful, if it has very little to do with, with an MBA program or a business school, but rather the people that are identified as successful in the business community for other reasons, for their tacit knowledge, which by definition they can't express. Well, uh, we're getting pretty close with that. I, I would say when I was pointing to Dick Tarling, when you're a financial whiz, you're not actually moving piles of money from one side of your desk to the other. Okay? You're looking at, at uh, pieces of paper and you're talking to people on the phone. Right. So what Dick Tarling was able to do was inhabit the universe of finance talk and spot opportunities and threats and organize activities in a particular way. So tacit knowledge, yes, but the term tacit denies the phronesis. 
denies the contextuality. It's, again, an affliction of principle. We imagine that there is an entire category of knowledge that's tacit. No, all tacit means is an ability to speak to a particular universe of human activity in a way that reflects more of the knowledge derived from practice than the knowledge derived from principle. Right. It's exposure over time and experience. The very attempt to categorize tacit is a misunderstanding of its nature in the same way as racism is a misunderstanding, an attempt to categorize human beings. And if you do categorize human beings, that entails certain penalties and consequences. If you categorize knowledge as tacit, that brings forth certain penalties and disabilities, because ultimately, it all comes down to the instance, the application of imagination to the particular instance, the moment in the medical career where you say, the principle we are told should be this, but we're going to put the principle aside for some, what we might call higher principle, you know, the humanity of the situation. The reason that I started the License to Lead podcast is to fan the flame of physician leadership so that in the profession of medicine and in healthcare systems, that we have physicians who have that background, which I think is necessary, not sufficient, but necessary to lead healthcare organizations, that physicians should be that subset of physicians who are drawn to and able to absorb the economic language to the degree that they need it to be facile and use it, that it should be physicians running healthcare organizations. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I think it's a, it's a, a misdiagnosis, <laughs> if I might say that, with respect. You know, you know a lot more about this than I do. Um, modern organizations, indeed, what we mean by modernity is a certain complexity, which was, in our view, not present at an earlier time. So when I gave the example of, of my venerable forebear uh, in Bath running his, uh, his practice out of his front room with his wife keeping the books. Jotting down that osteoarthritis diagnosis. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, that presupposes a certain simplicity, which is, of course, a conceit because life was no more simple then <laughs> than it is now. But we deal with a structural complexities, which our forebears did not have to deal with. And the ability to lead is to resolve the contests of values that are implicit with recognizing the plurality of conversations. So our whole discussion here has been me saying there has to be a medical conversation, which you know better than I, and I'm saying that because a hospital is an economic entity as well as a health entity, yes. there has to be an economic conversation. And the skill is in resolving the contradictions and contests of values that are implicit in those two conversations. And of course, it's not only two conversations, because we also have extraordinarily complicated conversations about employing other people, you know, what we work life balance or, you know, and then we have a new conversation that's bursting into uh, the discourse, which is to do with environmental sustainability, ecological issues, politics, uh, quite aside from politics, Mm -hmm. right, which the political conversation as well is is enormous in in healthcare. Absolutely. So Mm -hmm. the leader, I I would say, you step out of one fire into another, if you say, let's get rid of the accountants, and let's have the doctors lead. Now, listen, I I I, wouldn't want you to put those words in my mouth, because (laughs) I, I don't I don't think it would even be plausible to not have Extraordinarily talented. No, no, no. I mean, we're agreed, but accountants. We're agreed, but I wanted to uh, sort of slap you on the wrist as a student and say, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. It's you can't step from one fire into the other. Okay. The modern condition is pluralist. 
the many conversations. Yes. You, you hope that you have educated people, which is people who can speak to several conversations. And what you want in medical school is people who can speak to the medical circumstances, but also the humanitarian and ethical issues. So there's three conversations. In business school, you hope you have people who can speak to the economic issues and also the marketing issues and you know, so forth and so on. It's the complexity, the multiplicity, the plurality of conversations that is the fundamental challenge for leadership. Yes. I think being able to speak multiple languages, have multiple conversations, because it's never purely one. That's, right. you know, that's not the stuff of humanity. Right. And the, the whole point of the Tower of Babel story is this dream that there was once one language which everybody spoke and everybody understood each other, this myth, because the reality is not only do you and I not understand each other, we don't even understand ourselves because being educated people, okay, unlike some people, let's say, in the early medieval period, who only had one language, which was the language of the church, in which the prism through which all of life was viewed. Okay? We have multiple languages. This is the modern condition. Right. But it's exactly, it's like a curse. This is what, it's like, okay. It's what leaders do, though. It's probably a reasonable, it, at least a reasonable inclusion in the definition of leadership would be the ability to embrace, understand the need for, at least understand the need for multiple languages, multiple conversations. Right. Well, the impossibility of leading without embracing multiple conversations. Lovely. And, and you know, the, I mean, the whole of this uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, is, is an express statement of how an entire community's way of talking is silenced institutionally and politically. Right. Okay. We do, you know, no, this is not just about police. It's about the fact that we are not heard. Our language is silenced, which goes back to, if you recall, when Oliver Cromwell, which is a name you know, Oliver Cromwell conquered Ireland, he eliminated Gaelic. It became a capital offense to speak in your own language. So almost everything I talk about nowadays deals with language. Business schools are language schools, madrasas. Explain, med- explain madrasas. Madrasas, uh, the, the classic madrasa is the Islamic madrasa where you spend your time studying the Quran. The Yiddish uh, schools are exactly the same. You s- spend all of your time studying uh, the rabbinical texts. And in Catholic school, you would spend a lot of time s- discussing Catholic texts and so forth. So uh, madrasas are where the emphasis is on training people into a language and the offensive aspect of madrasas, same as the offensive aspect of uh, a Catholic, um, uh, what do we call them, uh, Catholic schools. Uh, well, I went to nine years of Catholic school, but I'm not coming up with it for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, offen- the seminary, seminary, right, mm-hmm. right. The offensive part of a, of of the seminary or the madrasa is the silencing of the other ways of thinking and talking. That's an offense against human nature because human nature embraces pluralism. We have all kinds of interests, you know, interests in bird watching, interests in theater, interests in cooking, interests in the opposite sex or whatever. I mean, the human being is gifted with a pluralistic attention and imagination. Well, Dr. Spender, I think we should wrap up our conversation here. And I won't exclude the possibility that we will want to climb on the podcast again. I have to say I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much. I've very much enjoyed uh, talking about this stuff, which animates me, as you can tell. Um, And I think what you're trying to do here uh, for people in the medical industry is incredibly important. So anytime you can make use of me again, I'll be very happy to let that happen. It's just been such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 
That was certainly a treat spending time with Professor Spender. I especially liked his emphasis on imagination and how it is the uniquely human imagination arising in the face of uncertainty that creates value in an organization. And for me, it was a sobering perspective to consider how the outsized work ethic of, for instance, physicians and the physician's imagination and intellect, which they use to meet the demands of the uncertain healthcare world, are being captured and monetized by opportunists who don't belong in the healthcare world. Those are my words. Here are Dr. Spenders. What kind of ethics are involved in the monetization of your imagination so that my shareholders don't throw me out? This adds a dimension to my conviction that as physicians, with our expertise and our obligations to patients, we gotta be leading this profession and be leading healthcare. I promised a few outtakes. At one point, I was concerned that we were veering off the path of medicine and managerialism and plunging into some historical abyss. It actually goes back to Bismarck. This is why the history of management education is so interesting. Listen to me try to grab the reins. JC, I would like to derail us from Bismarck. Dr. Spender had the bit in his teeth and was galloping down this road. This is very short. I just want to give you this one minute. And I'm so glad he took that one minute. Which is the, the people who did this knew, for the most part, that it was bullshit. He won my heart. I'm a sucker for a truth bomb. And who was that mysterious caller in the middle of our podcast? Here we go. (laughs) Uh, Can I stop for a second? Yes, my sweet, I'm in the middle. After several more my sweets, Dr. Spender eased off his phone call. Oh, super. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. That was my wife who's managing to get a booster shot as we speak. That was great news for my guest and for his wife, and I wish them both wonderful health. A few listeners who know me well no doubt wonder why I so wholeheartedly embraced Dr. Spender's somewhat fractious conversational style, but heck, I just love the guy. I'll put JC's contact information and resources in the show notes, and also more information and Spenderisms in the License to Lead newsletter. You can subscribe to my newsletter at fayconsulting.com. And if you have any spenderisms, I'd love to hear yours too. Thanks everybody for listening and thank you, as always, for all of your care and caring. Thanks for listening to the License to Lead podcast. Be sure to visit licensedtoleadpodcast.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and sign up for our newsletter. Leave us a message with your provocative question or your thoughtful comments you might inspire a future episode of the License to Lead podcast. Thanks so much, everyone.